I'm talking to Ron Balliser. He is the director or the chairman of the Clalit Innovation Center, which is about 70 people who work here and is the heart of the innovation. So, uh, Ron, and you also were the one who uh, headed the uh, COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19. What was that? Uh, it was an action group or an action center? Uh, no, the, the, this is a national role, so I'm responsible for the national advisory uh, expert group on COVID-19 uh, response. So that uh, yeah. Uh, so that been so let's talk about that later. First, I mean, you have 50% of the health of all the members. You you're the biggest HMO. You have huge amount of record sets, and you're uh, you know you're the head of innovation. H how does that work? How do you get all the innovation inside an organization, and how do you share it with the rest of the world? Good. So the, the first process is really to be connected to the strategic goals of the organization. Innovation is not an aim by itself. It's means for an end. Mm -hmm. And the end is transformation. Healthcare systems currently are basically non-sustainable. Population becomes older, becomes sicker, multimorbidity becomes an issue. The cost per patient continuously increases and also the needs for care by, by health staff that is continuously diminishing. Mm -hmm. So you will either... Very positive view of the future. It is. If yeah. you continue in the same... Uh, way that we are right now, this is non-sustainable. You'll hit a brick wall. Yeah. Uh, w and then you're a country, us? and then you're a country which has 10% uh, elderly people above 65. We are 25, and then Japan, etc. And you're predicting that already for your country, where the average age is 30. It is true, but we are aging more quickly than other countries. So the problem is is near and dear to our hearts as well. Okay. So this is a very practical issue. And if you don't change course, mm -hmm. you, the physicians will burn out the system will fail in terms of quality, continuously fail, and so you do not really have a choice. If you continue course, you'll fail. Okay. So it will, you'll gradually fail, but it will be pain, the pain will continuously increase, and you'll just... So the urgency is there, the, so uh, what, do you, what do you do? So okay. what do you do? So we are fortunate because we have the largest data troves in the world. We are a payer provider system that is both, uh, has all of the payer approach data, mm -hmm. the, the costs and the procedures and everything within and outside the system, and on the other hand with the provider, with primary care, specialty care, and hospital care, all happening under one roof. So Clade is very unique in that sense. This is fully integrated by design. In our data, we collect all the data into a cent to a central data warehouse, single EMR in the, all of our hospitals, 14 hospitals, yeah. single EMR. But only for Clalit, eh? but for only for 50%, but only you work together with the other information, we, we but yeah. We get all the, the information from a national level. So you have this drove of data. What we've been doing with it is dramatically changing the way we pro provide care to a predictive, proactive approach. And this predictive, proactive care is not a slogan, is not a kind of a, a concept. It is something we do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So even as early as 2011, we created our first predictive models based on this data to understand which of our patients are going to deteriorate to renal failure five years from now. Mm -hmm. So when you know who's going to deteriorate five years from now, you can provide them care today that would prevent their future illness. It's cheaper now. Mm -hmm. It's easier now. It's less painful. And eventually it saves if you are the payer for a longer term yeah. and you don't have a short term. And you can do that because as an HMO, you're also the insurer. So you're more flexible in paying for prevention if you know that it will save you money in the future. Because we're payers and because yeah. we're long-term payers. 90% yeah. of our patients were born Clalit members and will die at 82 Clalit members. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep them healthy. We're not about, you know, pushing volume. No. We're all about extracting value from the money we invest in them in order to keep them healthy. Our CFO and CMO, they're aligned. Yeah. It's not like other organizations that say that, that prevention and, and healthy people are not a business case. Yeah. For so us, you're vertically integrated yes. and you're allowed to do for long-term thing. Okay. Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so what kind of practical steps have you taken? Uh, what, what can you show us in this example? So one example I think which is very interesting is that we created a platform that collects, uh, the, the physicians come on the morning, the beginning of his work week. He has on his screen from the 2,000 patients he's responsible for, the 10 most critical, most important patients he needs to intervene uh, on proactively proactively uh -huh. they never came to the office they feel fine they look fine yeah. but the computer tells them these are the 10 you need to tackle today mm -hmm. and then when you open each one it tells these are the the, the procedures and, and things you need to do to them on a proactive approach yeah. one needs something to prevent future kidney disease one needs something to prevent future diabetes that is going to deteriorate someone has a colon cancer that so it's a dream that's a dream come true and there's now a hundred there's now a hundred doctors are, are using that platform 100 right hundred doctors and the aim by the end of this year that was 
input by the CEO of Clarit is that yes. one third of the GPs in Clarit will use it, and within two years we're going to cover everyone. So, so right now this is you know, and we've been doing this type of work, but haphazardly, mm -hmm. by sending lists to physicians. We've been doing it for over a decade, but now it's all centralized. So this is an example for the type of innovation we do, and it's all internal innovation. It's yeah. it's nothing that we buy from the outside. Yeah, and but you also have 65 companies uh, which you work together with, or basically startups. Uh, how does you how do you work that, and what kind of practical influence does it have uh, on the workplace? Workplace. So we we do two different things. One is we spin out ideas from within the organizations. Within Kalit Innovation, we have a group of people responsible for entrepreneurship, trying to encourage people to invent and create and use our data and other platforms in order to create also to create startups. Mm -hmm. And and we have a tech transfer company that turns them into startups and get investment in them. So this is one approach. The other one is what we call e open innovation. And again, in Kalit Innovation, there's a group of people that's responsible for looking at the local and international startup yep. and other uh, technology arena, find the most promising solutions, bring them over here, make them a design partner or a co-development or, 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 or a scaling partner with us. And we take their technology, we integrate it, and we use it at scale in order to improve care. Yeah. So Every, everybody does that. I just want to know how much, uh, how long, it takes a long time before these these companies are grown up enough to either make money or to be an, uh, an healthcare pro provider for you. How far are you in that process that it's actually used internally? There are quite a few uh, examples of things that are being used in practice. I would have to tell you one example, for instance, so Zebra Medical Vision is a company that was started actually with Clarit Data about seven years ago, and they, they created very interesting uh, intervention um, based on uh, using taking CTs and imaging studies, doing AI and cr extracting new data from that. Th these types of things are now embedded in, 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 you know, the system I told you about? Yeah. So when it does the cardiovascular prediction and finding out the patients, it actually based on data from CTs these patients have done yeah. and introduces where they you know the calcium scores within their, their, their coronary arteries is as feeding the predictive model that prevents, that identifies those patients that we want to take care of on Sunday morning. In the Fa fascinating, case. fascinating. So this is a practic very practical. Yeah. Example. And we're, we're welcoming additional collaborations, and again, this is part of what we do. Yeah. Two other very fascinating things. I mean, Harvard is really interested in you. They basically, they also providing finances for this, uh, for this uh, lab. How do you work together with them? So again, we have international collaborations with many international uh, friends. Uh, Harvard is really one of our strongest collaborations. So there's a what is called the Ivan and Francesca Berkowitz uh, Collaborative. It's uh, based by by a kind donation by uh, um, and based and and through that, uh, we've been able to create a joint platform in which we co-research data both on both sides of the pond and we do this together mm -hmm. but we also created a clinic here that takes care of the most complex patients genomically and we do genomic assessment together to understand what the problem is with that patient with that family to decipher the unique problem and then learn from it for other patient populations so we try to take from the person and in parallel we have a group of great scientists and postdocs that work on both sides of the pond uh, postdoc uh, our, our staff doing postdocs at Harvard and, and, and their staff coming here. And so this is the type of collaboration. And actually today, I'm taking a group of 15 physicians. Later on today, I'm flying out to Berlin, uh, to Charité, where I'm taking 15 uh, Clarit physicians to create research and implementation groups with their peers at Charité to create innovation. And then the German Israeli Foundation is helping us uh, with doing that. So, so there's different models in different yeah. places. And, and this has been going on for a, quite a while, yeah. but you, but the Israel really rise to the eye of the world during COVID, all right? And COVID, then everybody goes, what's happening with Israel? Everybody has, the, they, they have all the numbers, they have the figures, they have the Pfizer connection, and you were part of that national group. Can you describe your role in there? So I had two roles, basically. One is I was chairing the national expert advisory. So I was giving the uh, uh, advice to the, the prime minister and the government. And I was in every cabinet meeting from the beginning of the crisis until today. Probably the only one who survived all the way through because I'm not a political figure. I was the, the, the uh, um, professional advisor in the room. Uh -huh. And so that has, uh, has been interesting. But in parallel at Clarit, we here have created the first in the world assessment studies for vaccine effectiveness and our studies were the first to be published globally and in the I news. read them I read them we were glued yeah. to the screen when they were coming out every time you were about four or five months ahead of us and you were sharing your data quite a bit and what happened behind the scene to make this possible 
working day and night, the, the great people here at the Khalid Research Institute, amazing scientists, physicians, physicians that are, we have created here a joint training program that takes physicians and trains them in public health and computer science. Mm -hmm. So they do PhD in computer science and they do their residency in public yeah, health. And that in group department. was available for, for you to work yes. with, but I mean, what kind of intervention did you have? What did you have to tell to the politicians? Uh, I mean, they, yes. first, I mean, uh, there was, uh, they were very fast, they started, they said we will share the data. I mean, what 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 your practical inter in the interventions in that arena? So first was to provide them real world uh, uh, inferences in real time. So to tell them the vaccine works. The first question was, does the vaccine work? We were first in the world to introduce a wide vaccination campaign. We got 50% of the population vaccinated within a month, which was, uh, and, and everybody else were like, you know, six to 12 months it took mm -hmm. to, to say. And they said, but is it working? Because we have a lockdown and can we release the lockdown because this is working? Yeah. And so we published in February, 2021 in the New England Journal of Medicine, the first of its kind, uh, study that has done a real world assessment of the vaccine effectiveness and shown it to be exceedingly effective it works. and it works and then they opened the lockdown and uh, you know that yeah. was uh, and one then of the and then you're also the first to see hey it only works for a couple of months and we need to booster and rebooster and rebooster you were also the first to basically talk about that we were i mean we, we because we were first to vaccinate we also were the first to witness yeah. some of the waning immunity phenomena and we published extensively i mean there were dozens of, of such uh papers uh published in the new england yeah. in science and in other journals to, trying to to uncover some of the way this actually works mm -hmm. actually this week there were going to be some interesting publications coming out uh, so stay tuned uh, but um, we have a lot of um, uh, work being done on safety on effectiveness on uh, how for instance we've shown that vaccinating the parents protects the children mm -hmm. through indirect effects so this was part of it whether the uh, we were the ones to identify the side effects to report to the world about myocarditis, mm -hmm. uh, to assess its size. We had a couple of publications on this, several also pending. So, so it must have been hard to basically all say, hey, it works. Oh, it doesn't work for a couple of months. Oh, there's these side effects. So how was that to always be in front of the rest of the world and to have to convince them? We were very much aware of what lies on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. And we were very careful that everything that comes out of it here is going to be perfect in mm -hmm. terms of the analysis, the analytics, the data cleansing, the analytical process, trying to deal with the potential biases of observational studies and the causal inference in ways that have not been done before, working with our friends at Harvard and doing that, working with our internal group. Yeah. So we were, for every paper we published, we buried one that wasn't in high enough level for us not to taint it. Very, very complicated process. Well, in our company, uh, sorry, country, we had the Ministry of Health uh, really wanted to say these vaccines work. They were really, everybody should be vaccinated. Don't worry about the side effects. There's no problem. The politics were really so scared and so uh, and so busy that they always were trying to influence the the result of the studies and pick out do cherry picking how was that in Israel how much did the politics try to influence uh, the research and the publishing of information zero absolutely I had never not once been approached uh, by a politician no? or not once First, maybe they knew that there's no point. Uh, we are, you know, we have our reputation and we, we wouldn't risk it for the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was never approached asking, the, release this. Don't, they knew that it, we were completely independent. They could not touch us. Mm -hmm. or, you know, we were, had z we were not working with any of the uh, pharmaceuticals. We had no dealings with the pharmaceuticals. We were not de dealing with it. We had our own work. We need to advise, first of all, our own organization and then also the government. And we did this based on the best data that we had. When the data supported a certain post, that's what we did. When we said maybe oh, you should. So you did, you did it all through the book and there was no influence and that kind of stuff. Okay. I wouldn't, yeah. uh, at, the, at the point in which there was the question of how does this evidence lead to an intervention or to a public policy, their hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. Their uh, politicians were all around that, and justly so. That's what they should be doing. So in our, my, disc my other role as working as the national, working, advising the government on what to do and not to do, yeah. the pressures were immense. Yeah, because and that's what I was saying. You're at that cabinet meeting, and they say, hey, how is this with this? Should we do that? And, you should, and they want immediate answer, and there's pressure on you to give answers which they want. You know, we want to open up, or we want to not open up. There was, there was, there was pressure on you personally. So there you need to tell the difference between facts and opinions. opinions yeah. And you share the facts. And then how does that translate to a course of action is not dependent on facts, it's dependent on values, on priorities, mm -hmm. on risk-taking willingness. And this is something that politicians have the right to take. I can't tell them 
what is the right course of action because it depends on their set of values and what they would value more and less. So, so I can give them my opinion. They don't necessarily have to follow that opinion. I can give them my you know, estimates of the future. They're not bulletproof and they could be wrong. And they need to weigh all of this. And I have full respect to the different roles that we play. Did you have more or less trust in the political process after going through an uh, intense pressure process like this? Um, you know, I, I was very much impressed with some of the, the way this was done in Israel. I think that the proof of the pudding is in the eating and, and we've seen that happen and how Israel was bold and brave enough to take hard decisions in the right time in order to, to they didn't try to go safe, didn't try, try to wait for others to take the hard decisions and they would follow suit. We were always at the tip. And we knew we were working in a certain case of uncertainty, and we okay. knew we have to take bold decisions, and they did. Yeah. Now we're in uh, Ju June, July, and we're going to wait for uh, you know all October, November, and everything. All hell is going to break loose. Are you better prepared? Uh, you think? Uh, are we going to have a more smarter approach instead of locking down everything? Is uh, how do you expect the future in COVID uh, to be? On one hand, we're much more prepared because we know what to expect and we lived through this and we have residual immunity from vaccination and repeated infection. So we're better off dramatically than we were in March mm -hmm. 2020. On the other hand, we're also in a worse problem than we were before because of population fatigue. There's a huge, but nobody wants to take decisions skeptical. anymore. Skeptical, uh, some erosion in the trust in science and in, in political because of various uh, events. And so we're, we're in some senses, we're even worse off than we were before. And I thought it would be a big challenge. And finally, we still don't have a good answer to the coming waves. Mm -hmm. the, 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 um, we need better vaccines because of the problem of waning immunity and serotypes and, and va variant changes, specific yeah. that we need to address. So we need better vaccines in terms of longevity of their effect. We need better vaccines in terms of the uh, multitude of strains that they are adequately protecting. So we have moderate measures to be using and I do hope that we will not be tackled by a variant that will necessitate hard decisions. For now, as we continue on with the Omicron lineage, and the current level of severe morbidity associated with it and the uh, vaccine evasiveness, I think we can still make do with our previous uh, approaches. Thanks for your work and thanks for receiving us. No, it's really a pleasure to host you and you know, we're always open for collaboration. Yeah, so and see you in Amsterdam. Absolutely. Berlin, you have Amsterdam's next. Okay.